Jesus' name. Amen. God's own method for effecting changes is through his word. And as we behold him as in the glass, we are changed from glory to glory as by the Spirit of the Lord. Real changes are word affected. So if the word cannot change you, nothing else can change you. God's word is God's means for changing lives. That he might cleanse us by the washing of water, by the word of God. So he sanctifies us, he changes us, he turns us around through his word. So all the things we've been receiving since we came, it is to effect positive changes in our lives. So if those changes are not there, then we are not here. But I'm sure you are here. Amen. And the changes will be permanent. Amen. It will be an ongoing change in the many days of our life. Amen. In the name of Jesus. Amen. Please, you may be seated. Now in this last segment, I'll be taking us through this lecture that's titled The Power of Attitude. The Power of Attitude. The mission of this crusade is to turn us into men and women of impact. People that will have positive influences on our world. People that we have positive influences in our working places, people that will have positive influences in our families. Now, the, the essence is to make you a man and a woman of value, greater value than you were before you came into this meeting. What you are is far more important than what you are doing. It is what you are that the time is what you become. Am I right? No matter how hard working the chimpanzee is, when is he likely to become a member of parliament? <laughs> now, this is Kenya, and we have a lot of wildlife. And um, When do you think a lion will address the nation in Kenya? Would that be in English or Swahili? Now, no matter what he does, his nature places a limit on his destiny. Can you imagine a time when a chimpanzee will own a landed property in Kenya? That he walks up to the land office and he said, I need my land, I've been here for a long time. When are we likely going to have the first graduate? The first chimpanzee graduate from Kenya University. <laughs> now, even though he looks like a man, but his nature betrays his destiny. Did you understand what I'm saying? No matter how hard you work, without a right attitude, there is a limit on your destiny. It is the nature of a tree that determines its future. It is not the look of a tree. It is the nature. It is your makeup that determines your end up. Very important. Jesus was speaking. He said, you don't gather grapes out of thorns. Every tree produces fruits after its kind. There is no amount of effort that will make your orange tree bring forth pineapple. Fruits. So, every tree produce, the nature of a tree determines the future of the fruit it bears. So it is your makeup that determines your end up. Attitude determines altitude. Negative attitude brings about a negative future. I'd like you to listen very carefully because 
this will help to make your efforts fruitful if you understand the power of attitude. The power of attitude. In Matthew chapter 7, and you read from verses 16 all through to 20, by their fruits ye shall know them. <laughs> no evil tree can bring forth good fruits. Neither can any good tree bring forth evil fruits. So it is the nature of a tree that determines the kind of fruits it bears. And by that parable, Jesus was helping us to see the power of our makeup in determining our end up. Now, someone is so hardworking, and they are looking for who to promote, but it's hardworking, but it's also very proud. So they say, actually, is the best candidate for that job, but he's proud. So let's look for someone else. Who is not as good as him on the job, but he has the nature that is required for this assignment. So his nature has betrayed his destiny. He's proud. So no matter how hard working, no matter how purposeful, no matter how informed, if you don't have a positive attitude, it places a limit on your destiny. Very important. Very important. Abraham was not made by strength. He was made by obedience. By what? Obedience. Moses' greatness was not a result of his military training. Moses' greatness was a result of his meekness. And there was not... Uh, Moses was the meekest man of all men that were on the face of the earth. You remember that in Numbers chapter 12 and verse 1 to 3? He was the meekest of all men. So that was his qualifier. That was what qualified him to become the greatest leader of all time. The greatest pastor, shepherd that ever lived. He had three million people that he had to pastor for those number of years. He was the meekest of all men that were on the face of the earth. So every great and outstanding result is traceable to the nature, the attitude of such individuals. Very important. Think of Christ and hear what the Word of God says in Philippians 2, 5 to 9. Let this mind be in you which also was in Christ Jesus. Even though he was in the form of God, he took it not robbery to be equal with God. He counted not robbery to be equal with God, but took upon himself the form of a servant. Made himself of no reputation, became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore, God also has highly exalted him, and his impact is still on the earth today. Now, you see, what was it? The anointing was not his making. His nature was his making. Did you understand what I'm saying? He took upon himself the form of a servant, he made himself of no reputation. He became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore, God also has highly exalted him and given him a name above every name. So all said and done, it is your nature that determines your future. All said and done, it is your nature that determines your future. All said and done, it is your nature that determines your future. All said and done, it is your nature that determines your future. All said and done, it is your nature 
that determines your future. A negative attitude places an automatic limit on your destiny. And the Bible says, let this mind be in you. Cultivate this attitude that Christ possessed. He wasn't there like this. He made himself of no reputation. He took upon himself the form of a servant. He became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore, God also has highly exalted him and given him a name above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, of things in heaven and of things on earth and of things on earth in the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So you see, it was his attitude that determined his altitude. Attitude. Attitude. Haven't you read in scriptures, Jesus said, come and learn of me. I am meek and lowly in heart. And you find rest for your souls. And Matthew 5, 9 said, blessed are the meek, for they shall what? Inherit the earth. So your meekness largely determines your enlargement on the earth. A proud man is limited in scope and resource. Did you understand what I'm saying? Every proud man you see cannot go far in life. God can't stand another devil in town. <laughs> That's why God himself is blocking the access of the proud. Because he can't wait for another devil to lead a coup in heaven. And he gives more grace to the humble. So think of a man who has received an heavenly vision. A man who is adequately informed. A man who is so committed. And yet he's not getting results. But why? The why is that his nature is against his rising. Make the tree good and the fruit will be good also. So it is the trees you must make before you can de de desire what kind of fruits to come. Until the tree is made good, it cannot produce good fruits. Isn't that simple? Someone is an expert on his job, but he's a liar. So his nature has betrayed his destiny. Don't mind them, it can't be depended upon, it's not reliable. Can't use them for that. Maybe they are looking for one, two, three people to send on a mission to one country to represent the organization. They say, we can't send them. He's very vast in the field, but he's not the kind of person we can use for that. You see, I have been privileged to be around where major, major appointments have been done. And I discovered that in most cases, it is the nature of people that stands against them. Oh, it's very good. I mean... Uh, International affairs is, is wonderful, but it's lousy. It's lousy. You can't, it, it can't handle confidential matters. He speaks loosely. He's very good, but he can't be put there. His nature is against him. His attitude is against him. You see what I'm talking about? So that you will not walk in vain. That's why we have this morning session, this conclusion, something that you need to cultivate a positive attitude. A positive attitude. A positive attitude. A positive attitude. And that becomes easy because we are told of the fruits of the Spirit, which was the makeup of Jesus. Galatians 5, 22 and 23. And the fruit of the Spirit is, he listed them out. You find temperance, goodness, meekness, long-suffering. You know, you say against such, there is no law. So if you are born again, your spirit was earlier on dead. Jesus came and re-engineered it. He regenerated it. So you now have a living spirit. That means you have access to the nature of God. Hello? And all you need to do is to dig around it and water it. So it can begin to blossom in your life. You need to dig around it and water it so it can begin to blossom in your life. Without the fruits of the Spirit at work in your life, your life cannot be truly fruitful. Your life cannot be truly fruitful. You need to understand this.
Do you know why God will not allow the proud to go up? He made a mistake one time, and there was a man called Nebuchadnezzar, and he raised him up. And one day Nebuchadnezzar walked around the kingdom, the palace, and he said, this great kingdom, which I have built by the might of my power. Ah! God felt sorry for himself. And he converted him to an animal just there. Amen. It was a devolution system. <laughs> no. That's why God is careful in allowing the proud to go up. He wouldn't like to turn many more people into animals. <laughs> it will tamper with the ecosystem. Do you know many homes are victims of pride? The crisis in many families is rooted in pride. The man is so bossy, so high-handed, and the wife can't take nothing but what she wants. And Satan said, I'm interested. Let's break the home so you can run it and her to wherever you want. So you must check out on the fruits of the Spirit in your life. It is going to be an indicator of how blossoming your destiny will be. Until you possess the nature of the Spirit, you don't have a great future. No fountain can bring forth sweet and bitter water. So you need to check what's standing against your eyes and then put the things back. Amen. 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 Very important. Jesus said, I am meek. So only the meek will make it. And lowly heart, only the humble will fly high. I'm meek and lowly in heart and you shall find what? Rest for your souls. It's my prayer that everyone in this great summit will find the rest for his souls. Amen. By minding your nature. I've tried to also go further by looking at attitude from three perspectives. Most of us have negative attitude to God and that's affecting our line of supplies. Your perspective of God needs to be in place, otherwise you stand to be robbed of the benefits that should accrue to you as a child of God. God is a loving father. He's not a taskmaster. The Bible said God is love. God is not taking advantage of you. You are only given the privilege to take advantage of his love. God is not in need of your help. Amen? He only provides channels through which his helps can reach you. Is someone hearing what I'm saying? Say with me, God is a loving father. Not a, not a taskmaster. God is a loving father. God is a loving father. Not, a not a wicked master. You see, if you don't have a correct perspective of God, it will affect your relationship with him. God is not behind your problems. He is your dependable solution. God is not behind your problem. He is your only dependable solution. God is not depending on you. If I were hungry, would I have asked you? The thousand rams upon the thousand, he is there mine. 
Psalm 50 and verse 12. So that should make you be at ease when it's time to promote the kingdom of God. God is not depending on me. My pastor is not preaching at me. I am not qualified to be a God supporter. Did you understand what I'm saying? Yeah. If a truck is falling down and it's your friend's truck, do you try to hold it down? It will fall on you. God is too big to expect man to be strong enough for a supporter. You see, this will help form a right attitude toward God. He's not depending on me. He's not taking advantage of me. He's not a wicked master. He's a loving father. Did you understand what I'm saying? Now, if you check the story of the, uh, the man with one talent in Matthew 25, in Matthew chapter 25, this man said, I know that thou art a wicked man. You reap from where you don't sow. You see, if you have a negative attitude to God, it will affect your response to his word and command. Did you understand what I'm saying? And you know where it ended? No one here will end that way. Amen. God is not behind your problem. It's your only dependable solution. God is not to blame for your situation. He's eager to deliver the solution to you. Is somebody hearing what I'm saying? God is not to blame for your circumstances. He's not the cause. As long as Job began to continue to blame God, he remained in his problem. The problem was getting worse and worse. Hello. Very important. God is not a wicked master, so whatever he tells me to do, it is principally for my good. It's mainly for my good. God is not to blame. He's my only dependable source of solution for my problems. Job kept saying, I know you are the one who did it. Job kept saying, even if you kill me, I will yes serve you. And the more he said it, the more the devil was laughing. Because Satan was behind the trouble. You saw it in the Bible. Then when Satan and smote Job, it was Satan who smote him. All he had to say, save me, Lord. And the same day, the trouble would have stopped. You remember when Peter was drowning. He said, master, master, save me. Same time, he took him up. Many people had pro business problems. They say, God, look at you now. See what you have done. I thought you were there. I thought they said you were dependable. I thought they preached that you were reliable. See what you have done. Had a head challenge. Say, God, see yourself. See now. What am I serving you for? See the sickness you brought to my body. When you become an accuser of God, you may die an accused person. You can't turn your back on God and expect the journey to remain great. Without him, you can do nothing. So how do, you, how do you dare turn your back against him? Whoever contended with God and prosper. Job 9.4. You can't contend with him and, and still expect to prosper. You need a balanced perspective of God. God is not your problem. He's your only dependable solution. God is not behind the circumstances of your life. He's eager to rescue you from the drowning situation. God is not taking advantage of you. He's made himself available for you to take advantage of, of his love, of his faithfulness at all times. This will balance your position with God. Please understand what I'm talking about. Many of us have dented attitude towards God. It has dented our destiny very badly. We are listening to recover ourselves. Amen. Can I hear you say, God is love. God is the Bible says his commandments are not grievous. His commandments are not grievous. His commandments are not grievous. God is not a deceiver. He is the all faithful God. The Bible calls him the faithful God. 
God is not a usurper of man. God is a rewarder of those who diligently serve him. So God is not using you. God is committed to raising you. So get excited. Your attitude to God will be determined by your understanding of who God is. And that's what I've tried to do this morning. Stop pointing, accusing fingers at God. It's the reason why many people have stayed too long in their problems. God is not to blame. The devil is not at fault. We have been largely victims of our ignorance. Amen. Where was the devil? Where are not that's made it? He was still wherever he was. But in spite of him, by the light in which they are walking, they made a mess of every satanic assault. You shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. So please know that God is not against you. God is for you. God is not against you. God is for you. And every circumstance around you is brought there by the maneuverings of the wicked one. Taking advantage of your ignorance. But when you turn to God, he will bring you out. He didn't watch Peter sink in the sea. He won't watch you sink in your circumstances. Amen. Can I hear your amen if you're there? Amen. Attitude. Also, we need to get a balanced attitude to life. Come and say life. life. I'd like you to know that life is a gift. What is life? Life is a gift. May I ask this question? What was your contribution as far as your existence is concerned? What did you contribute to exist? What part did you play to be born? So life is essentially a gift. And that makes life a privilege, not a right. Life is a privilege, not a right. And every gift you refuse to acknowledge stands to be withdrawn. Life is a gift. It is a privilege, not a right. And any gift you refuse to acknowledge stands to be withdrawn. When you disregard the gift of life, you stand to lose its values. If you no, do not embrace life as a gift, you are out to be disgraced. When you embrace life as a gift, you will not be disgraced. You remember I said, you are fearfully and wonderfully made. Psalm 139, verse 14. So you didn't just happen. You are consciously created by God with all your intricacies. We are a sheep and the flock of his pasture. It is not we that made ourselves. It is he that has made us and not we ourselves. Psalm 100 and verse 3. So when you see life as a gift and not a burden, it will help your response to it. Life is a gift, not a grief, not a burden. You wake up in the morning, that's why I said, let everything that has breath, whatever else you didn't have, notwithstanding, let everything that has breath, do what? Praise the Lord. Because every other thing becomes relevant when your breath is there. When your breath is no longer there, every other thing loses value. So if you don't appreciate the owner of the breath and he withdraws it, 
you don't have any more need. It is over. Very important. Life is a gift, not a grief. Life is a gift, not a burden. Life is a privilege, not a right. Therefore, let everyone that has bread praise the Lord. That will help you. People are depressed because they have a negative attitude to life. They thought it's a right. Where you are is all of grace. You are not where you are on merit. You are where you are by grace. When that is understood, it will help your attitude to life and you'll be free. Amen. And you'll be free. Now, life is sustained by contribution. Sustained by what? Life is a gift sustained by contribution. Very simple illustration. We have life classified into two, plant and animals. And the animal begins to consume the oxygen in the atmosphere, which we understand is supplied by plants. Amen. And the animal itself has to generate carbon dioxide as some contribution to the atmosphere, which is consumed by plants. And when man stops making his carbon dioxide contribution, man is said to be dead. When a plant stops producing and contributing its oxygen, the plant is said to be what? Dead. So life is a gift sustained by contribution. Is that right? Uh -huh. So life is all about contribution, not possession. Now you see, when an animal is dead, oxygen is all around him. But because he stops contributing, the amount of oxygen around him notwithstanding is still called dead. Hello. Why we look at his dead body? We are still breathing oxygen for free, but he can't take it anymore. So your right to consume is determined by your preparedness to contribute. So when you stop making contributions, you stop living. You merely start existing. Don't you see when you say a man is dead, his two hands are there, and he's still looking at you as if he's smiling. Hello? The man is still looking as if he's smiling. So he's existing, but he's not living. Hello? If you don't understand that aspect of life, you just be there looking for what to consume all the days of your life. Life is all about contribution, not possession. Life is about relevance, not significance. Life is about service, not status. Life is about sacrifice, not surplus. Life is therefore essentially about giving, not receiving. So giving is living. Did you understand what I'm saying? Now see, this will balance your view of life and you will be driven to the realms of impact. Not sitting down and looking for who to cheat. I told my uh, personal staff in the office one night, we were up in the council meeting, and I said, okay, start brainstorming what is life. Now, by the time I come out of that meeting, you should tell me what you have discovered life to be, because you may have something and not know what it is. And they spoke all manner of grammars. I, said, I asked them to write it down and put it in memo form, and they did all that. And what I look at, they are saying things around the thing. What is life? Life is the art of living, sustained by contribution. Life is, is the art of living sustained by contributions. 
So when you stop making contributions, at any time, you have actually stopped living. So when you are going to work, you are on a mission to sustain life. Amen. That's what life is about. It's my prayer that no one here will miss it. Amen. Finally, attitude to money. Someone asked me recently, he said, what is your greatest secret about money? I said, greatest secret about money? He said, yes. There is no magic about money. Money is essentially a medium of exchange for goods and services. So, if you are producing nothing and you are offering no service, you are not entitled to financial transaction. Hello? Money is essentially a medium of exchange for goods and services. Some fellows stood by Matthew chapter 20 and they Jesus said, why are you standing idle all the day long? And he said, nobody hired us. He said, go to the vineyard and work. And whatever is due, you will be paid you at the end of the day. So they were not going to be given. They were going to work. They were going to render a service to qualify them for a financial transaction. Hello. But what should be my attitude to money? If you are not financially literate, you are likely going to become a financial victim. Financial literacy. Know what, how money comes and what it is come to do. If you don't, money is good to have, but it's risky for it to have you. So money is of great value in your hand but of greatest danger in your heart. Hello? Samuel Insull was also on that meeting. He was president of the world's largest utilities. He died broke in a foreign land. Howard Hobson, president of the largest gas company, became insane. Ivan Kruger, president of international match company, died broke. Leon Fraser, president of International Bank of Settlement, committed suicide. Now, you understand what I'm saying? These were the financial world powers of their time. But 25 years after, this was their story because they were not financially literate. They did not understand the reason for money. I'm not done yet. There's Richard Whitney, president of New York Stock Exchange. He was imprisoned. Arthur Canton died broke. Jesse Nevernin committed suicide. Now, Albert Fassil, member of president cabinet, just released from prison. Now, you see, Every one of them that sat in that meeting ended in the most miserable way. So it doesn't matter what you have. If you don't know what to do with it, it can wreck a great destiny. You can't live for money and not be miserable. Hello? <laughs> Now, it is true, the Bible says, money answers all things. Ecclesiastes chapter 10, verse 19. And Ecclesiastes chapter 7, verse 12, he said, money is a defense. But why did he not defend these people? 
Because when you don't know the purpose of a thing, you stand the risk of abusing it. When purpose is not known, abuse is inevitable. Very important, very vital, you need to get to a point where you don't focus on the abundance of money as you focus on the purpose of money. The most informative package on money is put in First Timothy chapter 6 and verse 10. The love of money is the root of all evils. Which some coveted after, they have pierced themselves through with many sorrows and have fallen into many diverse and foolish laws which drown men into destruction and perdition. But O oh, thou man of God, flee these things. Amen. Now see, it pierced them through with many sorrows. Those who live for money, they end up mourning. Many sorrows. You can't make money your focus and not be miserable in the adventure of life. Many sorrows. They are drawn by many foolish and diverse loss which draw men into destruction and perdition. There are orphans who have no one helping them and you put up money to help them. Hello? There are old people that are living like animals and compassion moves on you and you begin to set up old people's homes to look after them. Now you understand what I'm saying? That they do good. That they be rich in good works, ready to distribute, willing to communicate, thereby laying in store for themselves against the time to come that they may lay hold on eternal life. With that attitude, God will have no problem giving you abundance. Now, let me tell you something, to, it will shock you. Now, no matter the source of your wealth, if you don't understand that instruction, it is going to become your destruction. Look at Solomon, for instance. Solomon had his wealth from God. But if you check Solomon very carefully, after building the temple, Solomon just became a receiver. There was no widow helped by Solomon. There was no jobless people helped by Solomon. Solomon was just enlarging himself until the money destroyed him. Don't you know money destroyed Solomon? Solomon who prayed in the temple and there was glory. The glory of God came down. The same Solomon was sitting down in the temple of his wife's shrines. Solomon ended up his journey in a shrine. Money destroyed him. He, there was nobody that was said that Solomon helped. Poor Solomon. He didn't understand it. Even though his wealth came from God, that wealth still destroyed him. Because God is not a respecter of persons. That wealth still destroyed him. And every man that is blessed financially, who is not flowing out, is always very sickly. Miserable. Do you know what it means to eat food and not go to the toilet for one week? No matter how sweet the food, it has become poison in your body. So they take you out for dialysis to pump it out. So if all you do is accumulate money, you are digging your grave without knowing. You remember the story of the rich fool? He heaped it all up, built greater bounds, and said to himself, I got it. I got it till I die. God said, you will die now. I can't wait till when you die. You will die now. I can't wait till we die now. I can't wait to die now. So if your money is not influencing mankind, it will soon destroy the individual. Hello? Did you understand that now? With that... God will have no problem blessing your companies. He will have no problem blessing the business that you are doing. He has no problem blessing you in the place where you are working because your heart is there. So right now, 
Somebody has a child in school that he cannot pay. That is a privilege around you to determine how far God can enlarge your cost. My wife and I run a scholarship scheme. We run welfare scheme. We run health care scheme. And we pay that large, large sums. Somebody is sick. He needs to be well. We don't know who he is, but he has to be well. Take him to any hospital and get him okay. Whatever the amount is, come on, we underwrite him. That's why we're living a healthy life. I saw a young man in London. I met a young man in London sometimes last year, and he ran to me. And I said, who are you? And he said, oh, I was on your scholarship when I was in the University of Ife. I said, I didn't know. I didn't know. He was on a scholarship. He's gone out of school, graduated from the university, was working in London. You see, there is one thing you cannot misdo. It is called good. Every good thing that any man does, the same shall he receive from the Lord, whether he be born or free. So wake up and open up channels from your life to bless mankind around you. I don't care how much you have. I'm much more concerned about how much you are giving out. How much you are giving out, the time is how well you are living. So create that opportunity. Start now. My precious daughters and sons in the choir, start now. You don't do nothing just because you can do a little. The little you can do makes a difference. And inside that little lies a great opportunity. So come and go ahead and do it. Money is a cause when it's not available to be a blessing. You either allow it to be a blessing to someone or it becomes a cause on your life. So make your choice. Did you see now attitude to money? This is very crucial. This is very vital. It will help you many, many times in your life. It will help you all the days of your life. Money is not for accumulation. It is for distribution. And the Bible says in chapter 112 of the book of Psalms, he said he shall guide his affairs with discretion. So you're not just throwing around. You are operating with divine discretion. Psalm 112, verse 7 or so. No, he will guide his affairs with discretion. He has dispersed. He has given to the poor. His righteousness endures forever. His horn shall be exalted in honor. Wealth and riches shall be in his house. His righteousness will endure forever. He has given. He has dispersed. He has given to the poor. His righteousness endures forever. His horn shall be exalted in honor. So there is no healthy wealth without giving out. There is no healthy food without going to toilet. And you see, as God has blessed everyone, even so, let him give. So an elephant cannot give like a cow. The elephant will die. Hello? I mean, we have quite a number of elephants here. When you see them heap up their waste, it's like a moat hill. <laughs> and then he moves. Now, that is bigger than the size of a ram. You cannot expect a ram to discharge that level of waste. Hello? Now, see, I read the story of an elephant in the U.S. one of those days. We were up in the zoo. And I was told in that history that that elephant consumed 140 pounds of straw per day and excretes 100 pounds of manure. But the, hello, as God has blessed everyone, even so, let him give. Amen. There are people in this place that will build hospitals to help the needy. Amen. There are people that will put up schools to help the helpless. Amen. Many youth and children will go to school through your sponsorship. Amen. So the bigger your capacity to bless, the greater your privilege to be blessed of God. So you are the one who determines the limits of his blessings in your life. The more open you are to bless, the more committed God is open to blessing you. 
He said, I will bless you and you shall be a blessing. I'm not blessing you to be a consumer. I am blessing you to be a blessing. That's very important. So keep dreaming financial stewardship dreams. What you will do with money as God blesses your company, blesses your business, blesses you in your career. Keep dreaming true, genuine dreams of financial stewardship. And God will keep on enlarging your financial coast. God does not change. God will not change. I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, Amen. which is able to build you up and to give you an inheritance among them which are sanctified. It's important for you to know it is your nature that largely determines your future. It's important for you to know your attitude determines your altitude. Amen. And this is what I call the power of attitude. And I've tried to use three areas to help reshape your attitude, your attitude to God, your attitude to life, and your attitude to money. If you can understand that, you will walk on the safe path of life. And years after, you keep on just telling the story. That's what it is. God will not bless you beyond your readiness to be a blessing. Rise to your feet. Someone excited here, put your hands together for Jesus. He's alive. Come on, bless him. In Jesus' name. We've traveled through five main courses since we came. The first was the power of what? Information. And the second was what? What? Power of purpose. And the third one? The power of skill. And then the fourth one? Power of commitment. And this morning? Power of attitude. I believe God that these five power channels will successfully Change your attitude to life altogether. Amen. And I pray that you will become an agent of change to your generation. Amen. I pray that God's purpose for calling you up to this summit will not be disappointed. Amen. I pray that the next time we see you are a living proof of God's purpose for this summit. Amen. Lift up your two hands and thank God for granting you the privilege to be here and to be part of what the Lord is doing. Give him thanks for the illumination. Give him thanks for the illumination. Give him thanks for the illumination. In Jesus' precious name. God has not asked the seed of Jacob to seek him in vain. I decree that every word released since this summit began will find practical expressions in your life. Amen. I decree that as an individual, you will become an asset to your nation. I decree that every truth communicated will result in higher dimensions of triumph for you. Amen. And I pray this morning that the grace required to put this world to work in all areas of your life be released upon you right now. Amen. Whatever weakness and sickness and breakdown that lack of Commitment has caused. I decree your freedom right now. Amen. Every sense of indiscipline that has robbed you of the information required to move forward in your field, in your career, I command grace to take over from this moment. Amen. In the name of Jesus. Amen. Thank you, Heavenly Father. Thank you. Take all the glory. Amen. Take all the praise. Amen. In the name of Jesus. Amen. In the name of Jesus. Amen. In the name of Jesus. Amen. 
Come on, give the King of Kings a big, big hand. 